joyful piranhas, though. <laughs> oh, such good stuff. Such good, good stuff. Jeremy, thank you. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Well, beloved, we are in Luke chapter 1 again. We are going to be reading Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, reading about Gabriel visiting Mary this morning. If you are uh, able and willing, please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. And she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what, what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May God add his blessings to his holy, inerrant, infallible word. And beloved, that is all that we need is God's word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, quiet our hearts. God, quiet our spirits and our minds. Help us right now to receive from you. Help us to receive from your word. Just as Mary received the greatest gift that there could ever be, God, help us to receive the truth of Christ, of who he is, of what he has done. And God, help us to receive with humble hearts. Make us humble. Because, Lord, your, your word makes it so clear that pride goes before destruction. Lord, make us humble. Bless us and help us, we pray. We need your help now. And God, I pray that you would help me to not say anything that is not of your word. Help me to only speak your truth. Thanks. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, th this month we've been learning from uh, the angels uh, in Luke, or I'm sorry, in Isaiah chapter 6. The angels taught us about the holiness of God. And then last week, Gabriel appeared to the priest Zechariah, that father of John the Baptist, and, and we learned from Gabriel then uh, the power of prayer. And this morning, we're going to learn about humility. But we're not going to learn about humility from the archangel Gabriel. We're actually going to learn about humility from someone that in Protestant churches, we don't talk about very often. We're going to learn about humility from the mother of our Lord, Mary. We're going to learn about humility from her. Humility can be kind of a struggle for us, can't it? Pride is, is one of those easy sins that can sneak into our lives, especially during the holidays. Isn't that interesting how, how we struggle with humility during the holidays as we think, I deserve more. It's been a hard year. I, I deserve more. I deserve more money. I deserve more end-of-the-year bonuses. I deserve better presents this year. 
I deserve to finally get that new thing that I've always wanted. I deserve more appreciation. I deserve more love. But if you flip that, we can also struggle with humility in the opposite direction. We can think, I should be able to give more, right? I should, I should be able to provide more. I should be able to give better gifts this year. I should be able to provide for my family more. That lack of humility is, is a really sneaky sin in our lives. It can creep into our hearts even during these very fun, festive holidays. And in, in our passage, what, what we see here is Mary, this young girl Mary, She's being told by the angel Gabriel that she is about to receive the greatest gift ever given and the greatest gift that ever will be given. Nothing is going to top this. She's going to receive the very Son of God come to earth, incarnated, enfleshed, so that he can live this sinless life and die a sinner's death and save us from the wrath of God. And Mary gets to be the first person ever to receive Jesus. But not only that, she's also being told by Gabriel, you get to play a part in giving this gift. It's through Mary that Jesus is going to come into the world. Not only does she get to receive Jesus first, she also gets to be a part of the giving of Jesus. Can you imagine the kind of pride that might be able to sneak into your heart and mind if you were just told this. But Mary, when she receives this news, she doesn't receive it with pride. She is a model of humility. And there's four four lessons of humility that we learned from Mary this morning. These are our four points here. We learn that humility is surprised by grace. We learn that humility does not listen to its own press. We learn that humility isn't afraid to ponder really great things. And finally, we learn that humility believes the impossible. So let's go through those. Humility is surprised by grace. Everything about this moment is surprising. Everything about this is surprising. First of all, you have Gabriel. Who is this guy? Well, he's not a guy. He's an angel. He's, he's the archangel of God. He, he, he's the guy that delivered, the angel, excuse me, that delivered those great prophecies to Daniel in the Old Testament, right? He's one of the first angels that shows up and is named. And, and, and his name literally means hero of God. So this most important, greatest of angels is arriving at maybe the most insignificant little hamlet in the world at this time. Nazareth of Galilee is nothing. It's not even, it's so insignificant, it's not even mentioned in the Old Testament, right? It's small. It's probably a few hundred people. It's it's just seated on a cliff in the wilderness. And, And not only is Nazareth less of a town physically, we know from Scripture it's actually kind of less of a town morally. It has some moral issues. You might remember um, in John's Gospel, Philip learns about Jesus and then goes to Nathaniel and says, you got to hear about this Jesus of Nazareth. And do you remember Nathaniel's reply? Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that kind of tells you a lot about this town, doesn't it? Now, you might be saying, well, how corrupt can a little hamlet be? Well, Luke chapter 4, just a few chapters after what we're reading. Luke chapter 4, Jesus has started his earthly ministry. He decides, I'm going to go back to my hometown like a good prophet. And he goes to his hometown. He goes to Nazareth. He delivers the gospel. He goes into the synagogue. He takes one of the scrolls of Isaiah. He reads from it, and he says, guess what this is talking about? It's talking about me. Now, when he does that in this little hometown, what do you think the people who saw Jesus grow up in this town, they've known him all of his life, what do they do when they hear him say this? The text says they were filled with wrath and tried to throw him off the cliff. 
So, so warm and fuzzy Bedford Falls, Nazareth ain't, right? This is not a warm and fuzzy place. This is a wild west kind of, kind of town. And, and what's even more surprising is not who Gabriel, the town that Gabriel goes to, but who Gabriel speaks to. He speaks to a woman. A woman. That doesn't happen a whole lot in Scripture. And, and a young woman She's maybe 15 years old or younger. She's a virgin. She's engaged to be married. It's probably an arranged marriage. Most of them were back then. Now, now Mary is definitely afraid when she sees this angel. Nobody sees an angel in, in the Bible and isn't afraid. Because remember, angels are not cute and chubby cherubs. I know you love your little porcelain figures. That's not what an angel is. Just know that. You can still have them. Just know that. It's not a cute, chubby baby, okay? This is, this is an awe-inspiring being. But look at Mary's reply. She's more startled and more surprised, not by the angel, but by the fact that this angel says of her, Mary, you are favored. You, you are graced by the Lord, and the Lord is with you. Mary is favored? Like Mary? Like, like this little girl from this corrupt little hamlet in the middle of nowhere? Can you imagine what's running through Mary's mind when she hears this? Can you imagine? She's probably thinking, why me? Right? Like, what, what, what is so special about me? What did I do? What did I do? Now, what's the answer to that question? What did Mary do? Nothing. Nothing. A plus. She didn't do anything. Luke says nothing about having, of her having lived some exemplary life. He, he doesn't say that she was immaculately conceived, meaning that she was born without a sinful nature, like the Roman Catholic Church says. He doesn't claim that she's some queen of heaven or some other nonsense. She's just a girl from nowhere. That's what she is. What's so special about Mary is that God has chosen her and given her grace. He's given her favor. In other words, what's being expressed here just in the fact that Gabriel shows up surprisingly in this place to this girl is that the Lord, the Messiah, is going to come into the world through really humble circumstances. Now, could God have, have made it so that Jesus was born to some queen living in Jerusalem? Sure. But that's not what he did. He, he brought Jesus here. The message is clear. Jesus came to the least of these. Why? Because he has come to save the least of these. That's who he's come for. That, that's the clear message that's being that's being brought here, the lowest of low, those who have nothing to offer, that is who Jesus has come to rescue. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is talking about his own ministry. This is, when he's in Nazareth, in his hometown, this is what he reads on the scroll, and he says this is all about him. He reads Isaiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Who has Jesus come for? He's come from the poor, the captive, the blind, the oppressed. Why has the Lord shown up to this girl with nothing to offer? Because Jesus has come to help those who have nothing to offer. That's why. That's why. Jesus has come to open the eyes of those who are oppressed and blinded by their own sin. Captive to their own sin. He's, he's come to save those who cannot buy their way out of anything. He, he's come to help those who don't have the pride within them to say, I've got this under control. I'm in charge of my own destiny. I'm worthy. 
Are you humble enough to admit that your sin is a problem? Are you humble enough to admit that? That that your sin is actually an issue? Are you greatly troubled at your soul's need for salvation? If so, Jesus has come for you. That's who Jesus has come for. Jesus has not come for the proud person who says, I'm working really hard to make myself worthy, or I'm already worthy enough. That's not who Jesus has come for. He's come for the poor in spirit, the humble. Jesus has come to those who in their weakness know, I cannot do this on my own. I don't deserve it. Jesus has come for those who, like Mary, would look at the grace of God and say, Why me? Beloved, that is what should be on the lips of every Christian all the time. Because that's what grace is. Why me? You ever just stop and wonder that? Why me? Why me? Why would God save me? Why would God help me? Never forget, it's the humble and the poor in the spirit who receive grace. Lesson number two. From Mary, we also learn that humility does not listen to its own press. The the angel calls Mary favored one. Now, it's not every day that an angel comes up to you and says that you're favored, okay? Hopefully that hasn't happened for you lately. But but the Greek word here for favor is kind of interesting. It, It means that grace has been bestowed on Mary. It's been applied to Mary, In other words, God has chosen her and blessed her. Now, the reason that's interesting is because for 1,000 years in the early church, the the church only had one Bible. And the Bible, when it was finally put together, was in Latin. We call it the Latin Vulgate. And and, And we're very glad that the church made this Bible. Okay, They put together this Bible and translated it and put it into the language of the people of the time, Latin. However... In verse 28, in the Latin Vulgate, it reads a little bit different. It doesn't say, greetings, Mary, favored one. It says something you're much more familiar with. It says, hail Mary, full of grace. Now, that's not necessarily a bad translation, but here's what happened. The Roman Catholic Church took that phrase, full of grace, and they applied that to Mary in a way that was wrong. They made a theology of Mary that said that she is a saint who is so full of grace that she's actually a dispenser of grace. She's a giver of grace. In fact, in in the Roman Catholic Church, Mary is now declared a co-redemptrix, a co-redeemer alongside Jesus. So that if if you're Catholic and you pray to Mary and you're encouraged to pray to Mary, she can give you grace. You can pour out, she will pour out grace upon you to help you, to heal you, and even to save you from eternal damnation. Listen to a couple of of Roman Catholic saints. St. Anselm, it is impossible to save one's soul without devotion to Mary and without her protection. This is St. Germanus. He wrote a prayer to Mary. This is what he said. No one, O most holy Mary, can know God but through you. No one can be saved or redeemed but through you, O mother of God. No one obtains mercy but through you, O full of all grace. That's uncomfortable to even hear that spoken in church, isn't it? Now, if you ask a Catholic, do you worship Mary? They're going to look at you funny and go, no, I worship God. I worship Jesus. I pray to Mary, but I don't worship Mary. And and the reason they're going to say that is because in the Catholic church, there's worship and there's veneration. Mary and all the saints are not worshiped. They're venerated meaning they're they're honored, they're shown respect, they're even shown devotion, but they're not shown that kind of adoration that only God gets. They're not shown worship. Now, 
the, the French reformer John Calvin, when he heard this, he had a response to this that you're probably thinking right now. What's the difference? Right? What, what, what is the difference between these two? If I bow down to the image of a mortal person and pray to a mortal person to heal me and help me and save me, how is that not worship? And the answer is, it is worship. That's exactly what it is. If I twist Scripture so that when Luke says Mary was assigned grace, and I change that to say that Mary is a giver of grace, how is that not worship? If I take a person and say that she has the power to save, when that saving power is only ever assigned to God and only ever assigned to Jesus, what am I doing? I'm taking glory from God and giving it to a person. Beloved, let's just call a spade a spade. That's idolatry. That is worship. And that's a problem. Now the question is, did Mary believe all that? Do you think Mary would buy all of the press that's said about her? Would Mary have agreed that she is a, a co-redeemer alongside Jesus? Would Mary say that you need to pray to her? Or that you even can pray to her? Would Mary say that she, was, she never died and she was actually just assumed into heaven? Would Mary say that she was immaculately conceived and she was born without a sinful nature so she never actually needed a Savior? All of that, by the way, is Roman Catholic doctrine about Mary. Most of it made in the 19th century. So would Mary have said any of that about herself? No. No. In fact, let's just let Mary defend herself. After, after this passage, just look in your Bibles. After this passage, Elizabeth and Mary greet each other. And Elizabeth, she walks up to Mary and John the Baptist goes Pentecostal and starts going crazy in her stomach. Why? Because he's getting close to Jesus in Mary's stomach. And, and Elizabeth exclaims, she says, Mary, blessed are you among women. You are the mother of my Lord. And look after that. Look at the song that Mary sings. We call it the Magnificat. Look at this song that Mary sings right after that. She sings, My soul magnifies, not myself, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She was not sinless. If she was sinless, you wouldn't need a Savior. For he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant for behold from now on all generations will call me blessed N notice she does not say all generations will call me a blessing she says all generations will call me blessed why here's the next part for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is not my name holy is his name Beloved, these are not the words of a woman who wants praise and devotion. Amen? These are the words of a woman who wants everyone to glorify her God. Mary, Mary does not save us except, except by giving us the gospel and saying, turn to the Lord. That's the only way Mary saves. The same way we're supposed to save, by giving people the gospel and pointing them to the Lord. Third lesson about humility. Humility isn't afraid to ponder great things. N notice that Mary, she, she tried to, the text says she tried to discern what is this greeting? What kind of greeting is this? The language here in the, in the Greek actually indicates that she was continuously contemplating. Like she was really mulling this over. Like what is this? So this wasn't just a momentary like, what did you say? This was like a, what does this mean? She really thought it through. And apparently, that's something that Mary had the habit of doing. She thought a lot, especially when it came to news of her son, Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 19, Mary is, is lying in the manger. Jesus has just been born. She's holding the Messiah in her arms. We're going to read about this next week. And the, and the shepherds come, and they deliver this news to her about the, what they just heard from the angels out in the fields. And what does the text say? Mary treasured 
all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. At the end of Luke chapter 2, verse 51, Mary and Joseph make the the mistake none of us parents want to make. They forget Jesus. Okay, they forget the Son of God back in Jerusalem. They've wandered who knows how many hundreds of miles away, and they're like, we got to go back. I thought you had them. All right, and they go back to Jerusalem. They go into the temple, and they find Jesus teaching, and Jesus turns to them and says, guys, how did you not know that I have to be in my father's house? And then when Mary hears this and she sees Jesus being obedient to them, the text says, She treasured up all these things in her heart. I I had this Greek teacher, my first Greek teacher ever, was the private instructor. He he was this old southern gentleman guy, old pastor. And uh, and as, as old people are sometimes wont to do, he would give me life lessons but he would forget which life lessons he gave me, and so I would hear the same life lesson over and over and over again, okay? Now, by the way, that was not a fault of his. I probably needed to hear it a few times before it clicked, okay? But I'll I'll never forget this one life lesson that he gave me. It, It stuck with me. He said, John, as a Christian, not as a pastor, not as an elder, not as a teacher, not as a leader, John, as a Christian, the most important thing you can do every day is stop, look out your window, and ponder the things of God. That's the most important thing you can do every day, is to just stop and ponder the things of God. Psalm 77, verse 12, I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Psalm 143.5, I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. Now, now when, when the scriptures call us to meditate, we tend to think of Buddhism and like, mm, and all that kind of weird stuff, okay? The, the scriptures are not calling us to manipulate our minds with some sort of psychological trickery or, or something like that. When scripture calls us to meditate, scripture is calling us to love God with our minds. That's what it means, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind. It's a theological grace that we have the opportunity to sit and to just ponder who God is, what God has done, what he's calling me to do. Christian, in, in the busyness of your life, do you take the time to just sit and ponder? Or is your life pridefully just too busy for that kind of nonsense? Do you take the time to just stop and think of God. Think of what he's done. We sometimes say, why, don't, why is my prayer life suffering? Because we don't stop. Well, why am I so agitated all the time? Because we don't stop. Why am I a nervous wreck? Because we don't stop. Part of being humble before God means that I actually consider this to be of such importance that it's more important than the entertainment in my life. It's more important than the politics in my world. It's more important than anything in my life. And so I actually take the time to ponder this because these are the words of my creator. Mary is experiencing the birth of her creator. And she is humble enough to say, I got to stop and think about it. To quote the beautiful song Jeremy just sang for us today, Christian, do you wonder as you wander out under the sky how Jesus the Savior did come for to die for poor, ordinary people like you and like I? Mary took the time to wonder as she wandered. Do you? Are you humble enough to do that? Final lesson about humility. Humility believes the impossible. Gabriel explains that Mary is, is going to have a child. And this ain't just, ain't just any child. This child is going to be great. I love that that's the first thing he, he says. He's going to be great, Mary. He's going to be great, right? His name, Jesus, is literally going to mean salvation. 
He's going to be the son of God. He's going to be the eternal king that forever sits upon the throne of David. In other words, Mary knows this. He's going to be the long-awaited Messiah. And Mary asks a very logical question because she's a bright girl. Wait a minute. I'm a virgin. How is this going to happen? She, 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 she's trying to put this together. How is this going to work? And Gabriel explains that the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you, Mary. Now, that's, a, that's evoking Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 1, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters before creation. And then when God speaks, there is life. The Holy Spirit's going to hover over Mary. And when God speaks, there's not just going to be life. There's going to be the giver of eternal life. That's what's going to happen. Now, that's some earth-shattering news. Think about this. That is news no one has ever, ever heard, period. No one's ever heard news like this. I mean, Elizabeth can say, you know, there's Sarah in the Old Testament and Hannah who had a baby when they were in their older years. So this is not the first time, but Mary is receiving something entirely new. And knowing that, Gabriel actually says to her in verse 37, these are his final words to her, the last words he ever says to her, Mary, nothing will be impossible with God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that nothing is impossible with God? Have you ever, think about this, have you ever in your life ever said to God what Mary said to God? I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Have you ever said that to God? God, I am your servant. Whatever you want, anything, let it be to me according to your word. I mean, there's a a million things that must be going through this poor girl's head. She's bright. She's, she's probably thinking, what is Joseph going to think of this, right? Is he going to divorce me? She, she's probably thinking, what are my parents going to think of this? Are they going to kill me? She's probably, she's probably even wondering, I, I, this is not what I wanted for life. You know, when you're, when you're 15, you're thinking like, what am I going to do with my life? I don't think this is what Mary thought she was going to do with her life, do you? And yet, look, she doesn't complain. She doesn't grit her teeth and become angry. She humbly accepts that God wants her life to be different. And even though she cannot see the end of the road, she has no idea what kind of pain or heartache or trouble this is going to cause in her life. She's going to be called an adulteress for the rest of her life by her home, hometown. She doesn't know how this is going to turn out. There's a famous song by Mark Lowry called Mary Did You Know. One of the lines is, Mary, did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect sacrificial lamb? Here's the answer to that. No. She didn't know. She didn't know that her son, that she was going to see him hanging on a cross one day, unrecognizable, beaten, and bloodied. She didn't know that. And yet, even though she didn't know, she said, let it be to me according to your word. That's faith. And I don't think Mary said that with fear. I don't think she said it with anger. I think she might have even said it with some joy. God, let it be to me. I'm yours. Use me. Conquer me. Do whatever. Beloved, the the Lord can still do the impossible with humble, poor in spirit hearts. Amen? He can still do the impossible if we're humble. He really can. Is God asking you right now to do something that seems impossible? Is God asking you right now to endure something that feels impossible? Maybe he is. Will you humbly trust him? Will will you, like Mary, make the habit of your life to just always be trusting God for everything? If you can trust God 
for what seems impossible, hear me, then you, like Mary, are most blessed among the inhabitants of the world. Amen? Let me close by reading to you Isaiah 66.2. Isaiah 66.2, this is God speaking, and he says, This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Let's pray. Father, that's what we ask this morning. God, that you would make us like Mary, but, but more than that, because Mary would want us to say this, Father, make us like Christ. Make us humble. Make us contrite in our spirit. Make us trembling at your word. God, make us humble enough to believe that you can do the impossible. Give us faith. Give us faith that trusts you for everything like Mary did. Lord, whatever, whatever struggle we have right now, God, you, right now I'm sure your spirit is working in all of our hearts in different ways, reminding us, bringing to the surface of our hearts and minds, that God, those, those things that we're afraid of, we don't know, we, we, we don't, we're not sure what, what's going to happen around the corner, God, we don't know. But you do, and it's enough to just trust you. So, Father, give us the faith to be able to say, let it be to me according to your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close today.